matchless wisdom of His ways that mark the path of righteousness. His word. Hello, good morning, everybody. To those of you whom I have not yet greeted, uh, Happy New Year. Well, let me take this chance to greet you a Happy New Year. All right, tonight, today we're going to have a message, and the title is uh, When There Is No Fear. Of the Lord. But before we begin, I'd like us to have a short quiz. No, not a quiz. It's just an activity, okay? Don't, don't be pressured, all right? Uh, but I, I do want you to, you, you do need, you might need a pen, okay? So if you have a pen in front of you, you can get that. And you have your bulletin with you. There's a blank space there in the bulletin. You can write the answers there, all right? Or you can, uh, you can uh, give the answers in your mind and just Write, the, write down the number of correct answers. For example, you got the correct answer, you put a check mark in your bulletin. So at the end, you know how many correct answers you got, okay? So it's either you put in the answers or you just put the, when you got the right answer, you just put a, a, a check mark to denote the number of right answers, okay? We're going to have, okay, are we ready? Is everyone ready? You have your pen with you? All right, very good. We'll start, okay? This is a video. Number 10. Number nine. Number eight. Number seven. Number six. Number five. Number four.
Number 3. Number 2 Number 1 Okay, how many of you got 9 or 10? So you're in the genius level. Okay, don't be shy. How many of you got that? <laughs> All right, very good. We have one. Anyone else? Maybe at the back? Okay. How many of you got one or two? Below average. <laughs> okay, which question really stumped you? How many answer, there's a question, how many fives are there in 1 to 100? How many of you answered 11? How many of you answered 11? I did. And I was very proud. I thought I was right. It turns out there are 20. Anyway, so uh, this is just a fun activity uh, to test the way we answer questions. And uh, don't look down on the person beside you. If, you. if you happen to peek at their paper and you saw that they just got one or two a question's correct, okay? And don't feel overly proud if you got 8, 9, or, or 10. Doesn't, uh, doesn't really, you know, this is just an activity. It's not a scientific test or measure of your intelligence. Well, we know that there are many people who are intelligent. And then there are people who are wise. But there are also people whom the Bible calls fools. Today we will look at Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7, which says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Bible scholars say that this is the theme verse of the entire book of Proverbs. Because in this book, in this book of Proverbs, you see principles that extol wisdom and also warn against foolish conduct. And here in this one verse, you see it clearly. That contrast between those who are wise and those whom the Bible calls fools. The verse begins by stating that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The phrase, the fear of the Lord, occurs no less than 20 times in the entire book of Proverbs. Which shows us that it is one of the key themes, key themes of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord. Now later on we will discuss the fear of the Lord. But for now I want you to know uh, that the word fear as it is used in this phrase can have either of two meanings. Alright? The first one is a feeling of terror toward the Lord. A feeling of terror. Much like you know, uh, the feeling of a student who had done something wrong and she has been called to the principal's office. Does that happen in MGC New Life? 
Janae, do, you, do students get called to the principal's office? No? But in our time, I studied in a school that was very strict, all right? Uh, some of you may know it, Uno High School. And uh, when you're called to the principal's office, you go there with trembling knees. Okay, so that's, that's a feeling of terror. That could be the meaning of fear of the Lord, a feeling of terror. Or it could be, you know, the feeling of an employee who knows that, you know, he hasn't been performing well and he's about to be evaluated. He's about to go into the meeting with his boss for the evaluation. All right? That feeling of terror of that employee. He goes in th not knowing if he will still have a job tomorrow. This is the kind of fear that sinners ought to have toward the Lord. Because he is holy and just, and his wrath, his anger he is aroused whenever he sees evil deeds being done. So a sinner who is about to face the Lord should have this kind of fear of the Lord, this feeling of terror, because he's going to stand judgment. This is not just referring to the emotion of fear. It's not just, now fear of the Lord is not just an emotion of fear, but fear that brings a corresponding change in conduct as a response to that fear. So, so it has to have a corresponding change in conduct. It is not enough for that student to, f to feel that fear toward the principal, but that, that that fear should encourage the student or should stimulate the student to change her way of studying or her conduct inside a classroom. When a sinner is struck by a fear of the holiness of God, that fear should not remain at an emotional level. But rather, that feeling of terror, as used in Proverbs 1.7, should result in a surrender to God and a repentance from the sins of the sinner. So that's the first meaning of fear of the Lord. It can be a fear of terror that later on leads to a change in the behavior of the person. Number two, it can also mean reverence or awe at the Lord. Okay, the fear of the Lord can mean reverence or awe at the Lord. This is the feeling that a child of God should have when she becomes aware of the majesty and the glory of God. This realization should lead to a sense of worship, all right? A wor sense of worship and praise toward God. I suppose many of you have had that kind of an experience. And uh, sometimes I see your Facebook posts. You've been to a country and you've seen a nice, a, a very beautiful scenery. And then you write in your post, this is nothing but the awesome handiwork of God. That is fear of the Lord, a sense of reverence and awe at what God has done. This is the kind of fear of the Lord that David had when he wrote Psalm 8. He, you know, David, one night he looked up at the night sky and he saw the heavenly bodies. He saw the stars and he was filled with an inexpressible awe at what the Lord had done. And he wrote down his experience that night in Psalm 8, verses 3 to 4, wherein he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? That is what David felt. And that is also applicable as fear of the Lord. So whether it is terror or reverence that a person feels toward God, a proper fear of the Lord becomes the foundation of one's knowledge. Verse 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The word, now I want to go to the next word, which is knowledge. The word knowledge here does not refer to information that a person has about, you know, about science or about, you know, uh, history or languages. Rather, here it is used in the sense of understanding or discernment or wisdom which is consistent with the will of God. You know, King Solomon, who, who wrote much of the book of Proverbs, but not entirely, okay? He wrote much of the book 
of Proverbs was saying that the one who has a fear of the Lord processes godly wisdom. Let's look at two other verses where a similar thought occurs, where, where uh, King Solomon says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. In Proverbs 9.10, this is what Solomon says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs, uh, in, and, and also in Psalms 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. So one was written by Solomon. One was written by his father, David. Both say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible is telling us here that there is a category of knowledge or wisdom that can only be obtained after one has had an experience of reverent fear of the Lord. And we will call that godly wisdom. All right? There's a kind of wisdom called godly wisdom. And before a person begins to have a reverence for God, that person can possess, you know, a lot of knowledge. He can be a summa cum laude, but if he doesn't have that fear of the Lord in the eyes of God, that person is still considered unwise. That person is still called a fool because he does not have the fear of the Lord. And pardon me for being straightforward here, but the Bible uses the word fool to, descri to describe this kind of a person. In other words, this person is still a fool in the eyes of God because he does not know God who is the source of all truth. Now, some of you may ask, Pastor, in what ways is God the source of all truth? How can I say that God is the source of all truth? Now, I will answer that on three levels. Number one, since God is the creator of, and the designer of the universe, he would be the source of all truth about the heavenly bodies and, about, and the source of all truth about the natural laws regarding the universe. Number two, since God is the designer and the creator of all living things, then he is also the source of all truth and knowledge about plant life, animal life, and human life. Number three, since God is the designer and the creator of the human mind and the giver of man's intellectual abilities, then he is the source of the intelligence of man in so far as their thoughts match his will. Let's be careful here, okay? Let me be clear here. God is a source of the intelligence of man only in so far as their thoughts match his will. God is not the source of evil thoughts of men. And that's what Ephesians 5.17 says. It says, therefore, be, do not be foolish understand what the Lord's will is. Okay? It's either you understand the Lord's will, okay, your thoughts match the will of God, or you are called foolish. Because it says, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Okay? So, when, when, when uh, Paul was writing this, he was, he was moved by the Holy Spirit, and he was telling his readers, you know, you better understand what God's will is, because otherwise you would be considered a fool. You would be thinking and acting foolishly. So when a man's thoughts are not in accordance with the revealed will of God, God considers that person's action unwise and foolish. When there's no fear of the Lord, there can be no godly wisdom, only thoughts that God considers foolish. All right? Now, earlier I mentioned that the book of Proverbs contains many verses that distinguish the wise from the unwise, right? And Proverbs 1-7 is one of those. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. The wise will have the fear of the Lord, and by extension, knowledge and understanding. In contrast, in contrast, the fool despises these things. Now, I want us to look now at at least five things 
that mark the wise, but which fools despise. Five things. The first one. The first one is discernment. Proverbs 1 7 tells us that the fool that fools despise wisdom. Now don't get me wrong. I don't mean to say that fools are always unintelligent. That's not what I'm saying. That is not the meaning of a fool here. The fool, as used in the book of Proverbs, denotes someone who has poor judgment. It's not, un, it's not lack of intelligence. It's poor judgment because of a refusal to fear God. They may have wisdom. They may have a lot of you know, knowledge and information in their minds. But this is not the wisdom from God. It is a worldly kind of wisdom that brings division instead of peace. Now, I'm sure you've met people like that. People who are scheming, people who, you know, uh, who know how to play with your emotions, you know, people who know how to take advantage of your needs. They're very good. They're actually very smart. They, they know what you need, and they use that knowledge to take advantage of you. They're not dumb. That's why they're able to deceive you. They're smart. Now, you know, I've heard of stories of tourists who have been deceived by salespeople. When these tourists enter a store and they see something and the salesperson catch that, they would approach the tourist and say, you know, it, it looks good on you. It, it flat, that, that piece of, uh, that necklace flatters you, ma'am. And uh, you know, you're you're in luck because it's the last piece we have here in the store. We don't know when the ne next stocks would be coming. And ma'am, if you, if you don't buy it now, you know, I can't guarantee you. There's another group coming in five minutes. Someone from that group may get it, ma'am. You better may. You want it? And it looks good on you? Why don't you get it? And you, you begin to look at it. You think, okay. Yeah, uh, you say, you're, you're, you're having second thoughts, man. Maybe I'll, I'll think about it. And then the sales princess and says, you know, let's make a deal. I'll give you a big discount. Big discount, yes. You're Filipino? Big guy kita tawad. Right. 50%. Half price. I give it to you. 50%. But ma'am, please don't tell my boss I give you 50% off, okay? Don't even tell your tour mates I give you 50% off because you're the only one today in this store who will get 50%. No one gets 50% off. Okay, ma'am? You buy? No? You buy? Very good. You have a deal. You go out happily. But the next day you go to another town, you see exactly the same necklace for 30% cheaper. You've been had. Now, let me ask you, was a salesperson smart or not? Smart, diva? Right? He knows your needs. He knows that tourists don't have much time to, to, can, to ask around. He knows tourists are always in the, you know, under time pressure. And uh, tourists don't have time to, to, you know, to go back and complain if they see something cheaper. He also knows that tourists are thinking they might not see this, this exact item anymore wherever they go so they 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 have to take you know, take advantage of the opportunity he has this kind of wisdom in his mind and he puts it to good use and so he he's smart he's he's wise but it's not the kind of wisdom that god would commend in contrast this is the kind of wisdom that god gives in james chapter 3 uh 17, it says, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That's the kind of wisdom that God gives, not the wisdom that people use to deceive other people. This is the kind of wisdom, right, that is despised by fools, who have no fear of God, this is a kind of wisdom that is the mark of the wise. Number two, self-control. Uh, self a second characteristic of fools is that they despise self-control. Their lack of self-control leads them to make poor judgment and to do things that violate God's commands. 
In Proverbs 9.13, a woman named Folly represents fools. She is described as undisciplined, unruly, with little self-control. All right? Fools allow their appetites to control them, which is why they would do foolish things. You are controlled by the desires of your flesh. Proverbs 9.13, Folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. Another verse which depicts a foolish person is Proverbs 10.5. He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. You see, in this verse, there are two sons, right? There are two sons. One goes to the field under the hot summer sun, and he is there gathering crops. He's doing his work. And what does his brother do? His brother is probably, well, it says here, his brother is sleeping. I, it doesn't say where, but probably he's at home. He's sleeping at home during harvest time, during daytime when he should be working. Why, he is, why is he sleeping when he should be in the field? Where it could be because, uh, number one, he could have been, uh, he could be lazy. He just sleeps the whole day, all right? Or he could, be, he could have been enjoying himself the whole night, in the previous night, stayed up until early morning, went to sleep at 4 or 5 in the morning, and so when it's time to work, he couldn't wake up. Right? And this is a fool because he doesn't have self-control. He can't control himself. He allows his, the desires of his flesh to dictate his lifestyle. Number three. What do fools despise? They, despise? they despise correction. Fools don't like correction. Right? Proverbs uh, 10, 17. Whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life. But whoever ignores correction leads others astray. Okay? So there are some people who heed discipline. But they are, when they are told of their errors or their sins, they accept the correction. They accept it, but not so with the foolish people. Fools don't want to be disciplined. They don't want to be corrected. It could be due to their, could be due to their pride, right? They don't want to admit their, their, their shortcomings. They don't want to admit they're wrong, all right? Or it's because they, another reason could be they refuse to consider the perspectives of other people. For them, there's only one way of doing things, and it's my way. All right? All other people, all, all other suggestions are mistakes. And so by their stubbornness, these people make life hard for other people. And of course, since the Bible has said that fools don't have the fear of God in their hearts, it would be almost impossible to correct a fool using the word of God as a basis. You cannot use this to correct a, a, a fool because he will not understand and he will not accept it. They will always find an excuse to deny the authority of the sacred scriptures. That is a fool for you. Number four. Righteousness. The fourth thing that fools despise is righteousness. Proverbs 10.23 says this. A fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes but a person of understanding delights in wisdom. You see, fools delight in doing what is sinful. They like deceiving people to benefit themselves. They, it doesn't matter if what they do hurts other people as long as they get what they want. And fools don't mind. They don't mind what the Word of God says to their situation Precisely because there is no fear of God in their hearts. Do you tell them Bible verses about what they're doing? Bible verses that condemn what they're doing. But what is that to them? They don't fear the Lord. They don't have the terror of God in their hearts. They don't have a reverence for God. It doesn't matter to them. And sometimes it is not just by their actions that you recognize a fool. Sometimes it is even just by their way of speaking. Look at Proverbs 10.32. The lips of the righteous know what finds favor, but the mouth of the wicked only 
what is perverse. So even by their very speaking, the, the words they choose, you will know if a person is wise or a fool. You know, in our society today, we have many single parent families. Uh, these are due to the husband or the wife leaving the family or because the couple was not yet married when the woman became pregnant. Single parent families arise because one or both of the couple refused to submit to the commands of God regarding marriage and family. One or both of them, I'm not saying it's, only, it's always the fault of one person. Sometimes it could be both of them. One or both of them choose instead to do what feels convenient for them or what gives them pleasure. So today, you give me pleasure, I stay with you. Years later, you don't get, I don't get enough pleasure from you. I'm going to leave you. I find something, someone else that gives me pleasure. They set aside God's command for husbands and wives to love each other sacrificially for the sake of their own, you know, for their own pleasure or for their own convenience. That is foolish conduct. Fools despise the righteousness that God demands. All right? But for those of us who are wise, for those of you who are wise, you should train yourself to pursue God's righteousness even at, at a cost, even at a great cost to your own pleasure or convenience. So meaning if you are a wise person and you have a dilemma, you have a choice to make between your own pleasure or convenience versus obeying the commands of God, if you are wise, you have to choose the commands of God. Number five, what else do fools despise? They despise the fear of the Lord. All right? I would like us to explore with you right now possible reasons why many people do not have the fear of God in their hearts. All right? Why do many people don't have the fear of God in their hearts? One reason is because they do not know God at all. Very simple. They live in a place where there are very few or there is no Christian witness. All right? A second reason is they do not know much about God. They may have heard of God. They may have heard of Jesus Christ. But their knowledge is superficial. And uh, regrettably, they did not have a chance to examine the scriptures deeper. That's number two. Now, the third reason could be that the prince of this world who is Satan, has blinded them, right? And so their response to the revelation about God is to belittle the glory of God or His holiness. So these kinds of people have, you know, have heard about Jesus Christ. They have access to, to the Holy Scriptures. They may hear messages. They may have friends who are Christians who tell them about Jesus Christ. But because their minds are closed, because Satan has closed their minds, their response is to belittle the glory of God and the holiness of God. Proverbs 1.29 They hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. I am sad to say that some of us can be in this category today. You have heard about Jesus Christ dying for you. You may have heard about why he needed to die for you. You have heard about the majesty of God. You have heard messages about the, 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 the righteousness of God and his anger at those who choose to live in sin. You have heard God call you to forsake this world to follow him. And yet, some of us choose to love the things of this world. You choose to spend your time watching hours upon hours of Netflix than taking 20 minutes to read the Bible each day. You're willing to go to spend hundreds of thousands of pesos 
to go around the world, to go to exotic destinations, but you're not willing to walk 15 minutes to go to church to attend a Bible study. You, could, you continue to choose to be dishonest either in school, in your work, in your business, or in your marriage. When you do these things, you show that you do not have a proper reverence for the Lord. So let today's message wake you up. Wake you up and call you back to the fear of the Lord. If this message is speaking to you, please wake up. It is time to stop living according to the pattern of this world and time to start to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Let today's message wake you up and call you back to the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge, lest you end up as a fool who despises wisdom and discipline. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which is holy, which is eternal, which will outlast any one of us here. I pray that you will give us the wisdom from heaven, the wisdom that is pure, the wisdom that is godly, and not the wisdom of this world. May each one of us have that fear of the Lord, depending on our situation in life. It could be terror at your coming judgment, or it could be a reverence and awe at your majesty. But whatever it is, I pray that you will give us that fear of you, which is the beginning of knowledge. And may we not end up as fools who despise wisdom and discipline. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.